I had the shock of my life in January when my doctor said, pack up, you're going to the hospital tonight, and we need to operate tomorrow. I'd certainly had a history of back trouble, but did not know that my psoas, the pain in my left leg, would result in emergency orthopedic spinal fusion surgery nor that I would have two surgeries, leaving me with eight screws and two rods. I am titanium. <laughs> These last seven and a half months have been fraught with difficulty, some of the lowest moments of my life and some of the most profound joys. Any of us who have undergone surgery or have family members who have been hospitalized or stand beside our friends as they go through this process we know the depths of difficulty and the heights of feeling better. I can vividly remember when my pain pre-surgery made it difficult for me to walk, to carry, or to use stairs. Sleeping was difficult, standing was agonizing, and trying to retain my humor and humanity during that time was a challenge. Many of us endure such aches and pains each and every day of our lives. We have a habit of ignoring our health, which we take for granted, until all of a sudden there's something that's not working, and then we get upset and possibly panic. When everything's okay, we don't pay much attention. But when there's some kind of problem, we are forced to focus on our health. And it's far worse than having a flat tire or not having the air conditioning work or the ATM is on the fritz or some other annoyance. I'm so grateful for all those who have reached out to me since my surgeries. Inside the hospital or a nursing home, alongside the IV tubes and the metered doses, there is a striking feeling for a patient of being alone or abandoned which is mitigated by friendly words and faces. Being sick, said one pundit, is like being in a foreign country with no tour book. Just as no one can ever see an entire country's ever corner, we can never fully know the terrain of our own illness. We may need to explore anew. Illness may cause us to creak, have aches and pains, slur or falter. Illness may claim a body, but it cannot contaminate a soul. That's why in our daily morning prayer, we traditionally offer the Asher Yatsar, words which praise the finely formed network of our bodies, knowing full well that the marvelous structure and intricate design are a daily gift, the source of our health and strength. I know from so many of you about your own personal difficulties. You've shared your suffering with me. Each of us, when ill, can be frightened by it and courageously battle, sometimes even conquer, heart disease or hip replacement or so much more. How we all truly pray for health in a world seriously in need of healing. This has been an essential aspect of my rabbinate for over 40 years. I've gone to hospitals to visit patients, to bring them comfort, or a story, or contact with the outer world, or just a handshake. Sometimes it's to simply let them know someone cares about them. In our tradition, the Shekhinah, the close, feminine, indwelling presence of God, is there at the head of a patient's bed. And we who engage in the important mitzvah of Bikor Cholim, visiting the sick, are partners with God when we offer the silent and simple prayers from the heart for someone in need. Tradition says we take away one sixtieth of an individual's pain when we visit. Our Misha Berak prayer for healing is an attempt to break down those barriers of isolation and ally ourselves spiritually with those in need. Prayer can motivate our sense of compassion, reaching out, build on the concerns from family and support from the community that can be great and noble assets at moments of crisis. 
any of us who grew up with the Union Prayer Book or with Gates of Prayer, we never saw a prayer for healing. We ignored those needs in Reformed Jewish services of days gone by. We learned that healing is a huge part of the human experience, which must be echoed within the words of our prayers. This congregation was among the first to sing the Misha Berach, those words of healing that we led earlier, commissioned in memory of Jerry Rubin by his family, words from the Torah as Cantor J. edited them, and music by Craig Taubman. Because it is all in Hebrew, it's used by our sister reform congregations in Israel. We may not believe that our words will cure cancer. We may not be believers in miracles where human words can force divine intervention. God is not our cosmic bellhop. But we, friends, we are God's messengers. When the body needs repair, the emotions of the mind and the soul of the ill person and ours can be touched deeply. At such vulnerable moments, it can be really difficult to depend on others. Being ill can be extraordinarily humbling. It challenges our sense that we can do it all. It forces us to accept help from others. It can actually be a bit selfish to decline help because it prevents someone from doing a mitzvah. There is nothing shameful or embarrassing in accepting help. Even I thought I could do it all after I was discharged. It took some doing. Margaret's unique way of arm twisting. But I accepted my limitations and I had an aide at the house. Best decision in the early healing process. Some of us want the whole world to know about our illness and we broadcast it. We can't stop talking about it. And others among us keep a private tab on the situation. The parents of a young boy were concerned that he had never spoken. His parents took him to every specialist. None could unlock the mystery. Then one day the boy's mother placed his breakfast before him, and out of the blue he said, Hey, the toast is burnt! <laughs> mother was ecstatic. She asked the boy why he had never spoken before. The boy answered, Well, up till now everything was okay. Sometimes not all is okay, and not feeling well can play into our fears, our loneliness, our trepidation, hoping that things will improve, that we will leave the world of hospital gowns behind, that there will be a better medicine to help us fight our illness, that our physical therapy will help our shoulder or our foot, something that will improve our physical condition. Will there be a cure? Will I return to the me I was prior to surgery? Will this crisis go away? We may start to feel unbalanced and get impatient when there's a long road ahead. We can get angry and take it out on others when time is simply the handmaid of healing. Our spirits, even when low, are also part of the map of our recovery. At those troubled times, feeling bad, we may feel abandoned by God. I felt spiritually lost for the first time following my surgery. These thoughts had never welled up within me prior to surgery. There were lonely hours, trying times, and especially scary moments. When the physical therapist at the hospital asked me to come down from the bed and use the walker for a first time, I almost panicked. The longest distance I have ever walked was the six feet from the bed with the walker to the threshold of the door. I was frightened. I felt alone. Why me, O oh God? Where was God to help me as my heart was pumping and I had shortness of breath? But I made it. Margaret and all my family helped me come out of the darkness and into the light. I was grateful then and I've been grateful ever since that I have the ability to walk again. Such moments help us to take stock of our lives, what values are truly the most important. 
the faces of our family members and our friends appear to us more clearly. We recall moments of our lives with both pride and regret. We are reminded of what is most dear to us and treasure those moments more carefully. That's probably why our ancestors wanted us to recall the Exodus each and every day. When the Israelites began a singular journey upon leaving Egypt, who among them knew it would take 40 years? Perhaps they thought it would be a few weeks trip at most. Such a journey of transformation takes a long time. It required the Israelites to look into their past with deep introspection. They had to remember how they were treated and how they felt under the Egyptians. They wanted to ensure that memory would last, not only in our prayers, but also in our rituals from the Seder to the Sukkah. It helped them to figure out why it took so long to enter the promised land of Israel. And so it is with our healing, which doesn't follow a normal path either. It can be long and circuitous. It's filled with rules to follow and paths to walk, as well as moments of contention and times of strife. But with the advice and guidance and caring from physicians, therapists, family, friends, and maybe even a rabbi or cantor, we can make the journey along with all of its challenges. A visitor in a sick man's room asked what ailed him. After the sick man's response, the visitor exclaimed, Oh, my father died from the same disease. The sick man became extremely agitated, very distressed, and the visitor quickly added, Oh, don't worry, I I'll pray to God to heal you. To which the sick man replied, And when you pray, add a prayer that I may be spared visits from any more stupid people like you. My surgery and subsequent healing forced me to challenge my God belief, at, as each of us does in our lifetime. Friends, we can't use an outdated belief borrowed from the Greeks of a powerful Zeus in charge of the heavens sending down lightning bolts from the sky. We have to grow our belief, especially in the face of difficulties. I do not believe that God causes tragedies. My God, the one about whom I teach, the one I hope my children understand, the one to whom I pray, does not unleash thunderous pain, hurricanes of tears, or worry about bones and ligaments. The world in which we live has a built-in randomness, which is entirely unfathomable and unexplainable. And our good health and fortune neither send a message that we are prosperous and happy believers, nor does a negative medical diagnosis mark an evil person to be devastated by a terrible illness. To say that someone's lifestyle, religious faith, beliefs, or personal behavior caused illness as a punishment is a belief I wholeheartedly reject. This is terrible theology. Televangelist Pat Robertson once suggested God was punishing Americans with Hurricane Katrina, and that a pact with the devil brought us the devastating earthquake in Haiti. What happened is not a religious payback. He gives people of faith a bad name. God does not deliberately cause human suffering. It never ceases to amaze that in times of amazing human suffering, somebody says something that could be so utterly stupid, but like clockwork, it happens with some regularity. Rabbi Harold Kushner wrote words I hope you can take to heart instead. A compassionate God who grieves with us is much greater than a God who hurts us. Anybody can hurt. Stones can hurt. But you need great depth of soul to be able to reach out and help. When you cry out to God in pain and fear, how does God answer? I believe God answers by sending us people by motivating us to become doctors and nurses, good friends and neighbors reaching out to help each other. The problem with the reward and punishment theory is that it makes us feel guilty when bad things happen. What did I do to deserve this? And it causes us to be angry at God, an anger that cuts us off 
from the sources of consolation and strength which religion might bring. God helps us by giving us qualities of strength, courage, humor, and patience. We can't ask for a problem-free life. We can't ask God to make our family or friends immune to disease. We don't believe in a God who can weave a magic spell around us so that bad things never happen. But we can pray for courage, for strength to bear the unbearable, for the grace to remember the positive instead of focusing on the negative, to seek patience when complaining is easier. We may end up with more courage, more strength, and more patience than we ever knew we had. At times of illness, at moments of despair, what we need more than anything else is to find comfort in helping others and being helped by others. Our human kindness becomes the reminder of God's love and concern. The great psychiatrist Carl Menninger once said he never knew of anyone who was not helped by helping others. We not only give to someone else, but we also learn to accept from someone else in order to regain a sense of hope and meaning in life. A magid, a preacher who would go from town to town telling stories, once spoke of a little girl who was sent by her mother on an errand. The girl was gone longer than her mother thought proper. When she finally returned, the mother asked for an explanation. Oh, she replied, I met Ruthie on the way, and her doll was broken, so I stopped to help her. You mean you helped her to fix the doll? No, mother. I don't know how to fix dolls. I stopped to help her cry. I stopped to help her cry. May each of us care for one another throughout the year ahead. Amen.